Katie Gallo, the director of the Teaching, Learning, and Technology Center. We're very glad that you're here to join us for the uh, teaching <coughs> colloquium on student learning, the 21st century measure of teaching effectiveness. Um, some of you joined us a little bit earlier for the workshop that Dr. Nelson did from one to three, so there might be a little bit of redundancy here with what I'm going to say, so you can go to sleep for a few minutes. We'll wake you back up when Linda starts. Um, as I was saying earlier today, we sort of designated February as our assessment month. So we've been doing an awful lot of workshops on assessment from a variety of angles. Most of them have focused pretty much on assessing student learning and you know, the work that they provide us as measures of their learning in our courses. The colloquium is kind of shifting that a little bit, and it's still student assessment, but it's student assessment of us as teachers. Now, I'm sure most of you could very readily name some of the limitations of using student evaluation forms as a measure of your teaching effectiveness. I think we all have our gripes with them. Um, there is research, though, that also says that there is certainly a certain amount of value in student evaluations. But I think for the most part, most instructors would say, well, at the very least, it's not really enough. It's just one measure of my teaching effectiveness. And I'm not entirely sure that that's the one that should carry so much weight in my personnel reviews. So Dr. Nelson, who is joining us from Clemson University in South Carolina, um, happens to do an awful lot of writing on this topic. Uh, among many others, um, I brought a few of the, the uh, texts that she works on. One of her most well-known is Teaching at Its Best, which is, is this the second, third? That's the second edition. There's a third one. The third one is in the works. She's Don't also. Miss out. Oh, is it already? Yeah, Sorry about that. Um, she's also been one of the managing editors of To Improve the Academy, which is one of the main journals in the field of faculty development. So a lot of people who do scholarship of teaching and learning, those are the folks who tend to publish here, from across disciplines, uh, practitioners in the classroom, as well as folks such as Linda and myself and Chris O'Neill, our associate director, who do faculty development. Um, now, Linda is the director of the Office of Teaching Effectiveness and Innovation at Clemson. Prior to that, she was also the director of the Teaching Center at Vanderbilt, and she is also part of the UC family in a couple of ways. She got her undergraduate degree from Berkeley. Um, she was also at UCLA for a while. She's a sociologist by, tra uh, by training. And when I met her several decades ago now, she was at UC Riverside in charge of TA training. And so she happened to heed my call to my colleagues at the other campuses and say, come on down to Irvine, let's talk about TA development in terms of teaching and see what we can come up with. And so ever since then, I've had a nice, strong connection with Linda. Linda has published like crazy. I'm not going to go through all the titles. And she is constantly being sought after as a workshop presenter um, on a wide range of topics, I might also add, not just teaching effectiveness and student assessment of learning. So without further ado, I would like us to welcome her and turn the floor over to Linda. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dee. I still remember our first meeting, and Dee told me that UCI standed for under construction indefinitely. And I just told her today, I it remember does. that. Yeah, really. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and it still is. It's still doing it. So it was a very apt description. Anyway, it's, it's great to be here. Um, I lived 19 years in Southern California and uh, a few more up in Northern California. So this is. It's a little bit like coming home, and if, even when I go to Pomona, it'll be closer uh, to where I live, because I used to live, uh, for the most part, up in the mountains, Riverside, and then up in the mountains above, above uh, San Bernardino and Mountain Home Village, up Route 38. Probably never heard of it. That's OK. It's too cold up here. <laughs> it's, oh, it's too cold up here, 3,500 feet up. OK. <laughs> anyway, we're going to talk about student learning, but we're really focusing on the measurement of student learning. As a counterpoint, if you will, to 
student evaluations. So we're going to be t talking about those as well, or student ratings. So here's the promise. You're going to be able to design instruments, surveys, tests, um, to use as evidence of student learning at the course level in your courses. Um, and we, we're going to make these suitable for faculty review. So you're going to also going to be able to justify using your measures of student learning as a well, counterbalance or complement to student ratings. Um, I wish I could say as a replacement, but that probably won't work yet. Um, you're going to be able to evaluate the merits of the, the different measures that you're going to be getting, because you do have choices. Every single one of them that you're going to hear about have been used. Every single one has been used. So none of them is just like crazy made up. They've all been used to measure learning. And, and you're going to be able to express this learning of your students in very simple numerical terms so administrators will look at them. Right? They want numbers. They want something that's quick to process. So you're going to be able to do all these things. So hopefully you came to the right place. So a little survey question. Student ratings, we call them student ratings versus student evaluations, but they are valid enough measures of teaching effectiveness to figure prominently in faculty reviews. Okay, how do you strongly disagree? If so, put up your hand. How about agree? <laughs> Don't know or not sure. Okay. Disagree? Strongly disagree. Oh, okay. Well, you folks are generally friendly towards them. Okay. And um, I was too. I definitely was too, up until relatively recently. I was a big proponent of them. But things have changed. Students have changed. So this is why we're addressing this topic now. OK, there has been, first of all, let me tell you, student ratings became popular and started being actually like used in personnel decisions because they had a decent relationship to student learning as measured by tests and things and measured by actual learning. Um, the correlation was, oh, like around 0.4, maybe a little higher than, point, than uh, 0.4. The correlation goes from 0 to 1. So there was, it was modest but decent, okay, well enough to, to justify using student ratings as a bit of a proxy for learning. Well, that relationship has recently gone down the tubes, okay, and now the relationship is anywhere from weak to non-existent to negative. And the more, if you, if you, particularly if you measure learning not by some sort of test, but you measure it in terms of how well students do in subsequent courses, it really just goes down the tubes, strongly goes down the tubes. So, and you will notice with these articles that they are all recent, relatively recent. This is a new phenomenon. Uh, as a matter of fact, the evidence in favor of using student ratings, and by the way, people still point to it, but it's all pretty old. It's all done on a different generation of students. In fact, there are articles published as late as 2007 that's based on data collected in the 80s. So be very suspicious. You, you look to see, if you, if you come across these articles, look to see when the data were collected. That's most important. Yes. Have the instruments changed that much as well? Because one of the reasons that I said I didn't really know anymore about yeah. whether uh -huh. or not they were uh -huh. useful for personnel review is that a lot depends on the instrument. You know, whether on which side of the line I would put it. I don't think I'd put yeah. it extreme one way or the other. But I'm wondering if the actual tools that people have been using have changed significantly over the years as well. Um, people have been sort of like rotating around sort of like large sets of questions, okay? And, you know, when, when they're talking, they, they do a lot of like internal validity stuff, like when you're talking about the few organizations that are out there that say, oh, we have these reliable questions. Well, that just means that, you know, if you give it to students again, um, that they'll tend to give the same answers. But a lot of these validity studies are not being linked 
to learning now. They were linked to learning a while back. And all it takes is a while back. I mean, you, you, you can get into the 1990s and you're in that iffy, iffy territory, but you know, a lot of that stuff is, I mean, it's done in the 70s and the 80s. Students were different back then. Yeah. Wendy, you talk about this being, um, when we start linking it to future performance and, and future courses, are they looking at grades in those courses? Because doesn't that assume that the grades are actually an accurate reflection of learning? Yes. Which, which, it, as, it's, which as grades are getting compressed with, with maybe grade inflation, if that's what we're up on, but wouldn't that reliability also drop? Well, but you, you know, that's all you've got to go on is measures of learning. That's it. You know, is yeah, the students' grades. But you, I mean, but you're, that's what it is. So in other words, if a, um, if a student took a relatively, and this was, this was done, by the way, at a couple of universities, and it was done, like, one of them was like in mathematics, and I can't remember the other one was something like that. Um, there were different sections, very, uh, there were uniform sections, but some of the instructors were tougher than others at the beginning, okay? And so that's what they were looking, and they knew that they were tougher than others. And that's what they were looking at. So the tougher instructors received lower student ratings from those students, but they did better later on. So that's, yes, in terms, of, in terms of grades, in terms of test performance. So which really all we have to go on um, as far as that study is concerned. So anyway, um, I, you know, times have changed. Students have changed, and so we're, you know, we're not getting, we're not getting the, the um, evidence we used to get. Now, it's, it's true that, that you know, there, there are some instruments that, you know, you, somebody in the university made up the question, right? I mean, they just sort of sprang them out. And I've seen some of these questions. Some of them are you know, double-barreled. They're really asking two things in the same question. Some of them are just junk. This com complete, you don't know what, you know, what they're measuring at all. Um, but, you know, I mean, most of the questions I've seen that are homegrown were no more, really were not much different from the questions that are so, um, so validated or made so reliable. Oh, they're looking at very much, at, at, you know, internal validity, construct validity, like they're looking at different dimensions uh, as, you know, are they, are, are these questions measuring different things from these questions? Well. Yeah, you know, so we've got different dimensions there, but gee whiz, it, if, it might all be junk. Or they're influenced by other things. They're influenced by other things. Like, here's one thing. There have been an increasing number of biases uh, detected in student ratings lately, more so than previously. So there is very questionable factual accuracy to this. One thing we do know that students um, seem to bring a lot of affect into their ratings. Generally, how they are feeling about you and a lot of these biases and everything. So what we do seem to be able to read from these is student ratings measure student satisfaction in a customer sort of way. And this didn't even used to be on the table as, as, as something that would affect students decades ago. So we are get, we're, it's, it's not like these are worthless and telling us nothing, but are they telling us teaching effectiveness? You know, it's, as, as we think of teaching effectiveness. There's some other issues. There's a lot of dissatisfaction among faculty members about the reliance on student ratings. And just why I said, you know, factual accuracy is to be questioned. Boy, do we ever know that, because we've seen People, you know, st student writing or ra uh, numerical ratings that make absolutely no sense to us and are inaccurate. And you know, now this is just from my own observation that I have seen more bimodal distributions lately than I have before. And yeah, you have too. Um, and you know, like, hey, these people liked you and these people didn't. It's that simple. And there's nothing in the middle. And there have been people who just go, I want, you know, I don't, we go one to five, five is really good, and one is really bad, and they just go one all the way down, or two all the way down. And so with, they're, they're expressing their customer dissatisfaction. It's an affect sort of me measure, they're not taking those dimensions seriously. They either want to um, make you look great, or, or try to get you fired, in a way, 
and sometimes they'll, they'll write on the emails, this person should be fired immediately, <laughs> misspelled immediately. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, here's the, here's, you know, well, we're getting less satisfied with it. Administrators seem to be actually relying more and more on it in a way. I mean, an over-reliance on these. They have become more and more important as, teach, as, as any interest in your teaching effectiveness has become important in your faculty reviews. And so administrators have been relying on this more, on these, uh, these student ratings more and more. And so they have become more and more important, even though from the very beginning, back when there were these nice correlations of 0.4 between student learning um, as measured like by the final exam and student ratings, even then, even then, people from our neck of the woods, faculty developers and people who were in you know, gen just generally this part of, of psychology said, these ratings should never be used exclusively. Well, that fell on deaf ears, didn't it? Um, so now, on the other hand, a case could be made that administrators know exactly what they're doing, and they're interested in student satisfaction. They're less interested in what students are learning and more interested in happy students. Um, and in fact, I had an interesting conversation with uh, an associate provost who is close to the provost uh, at my university. And she said, well, yes, we, we, we know that they're not measuring learning, but they're important to us anyway. And you see, the th thing is, just this year, did we require other evidence to be offered and taken into consideration? Because before, edit, the only thing that was asked for were those student ratings, and the, all the way up to the top. So, you know, maybe learning wasn't as important as happy students. Here's another screwy thing. Why is it that when we're talking about accreditation and assessment at the institutional and program level, that we look at student learning, but hey, when it comes to us, we don't look at learning. We look at student satisfaction. Doesn't that strike you as odd? Oh well, I thought it was. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's, that, uh, that's, that's really something that's kind of out of whack, the different levels, how the different levels are assessed. So these are the measures that we're going to look at. Again, all of these have been used. Um, and so we've got end of course only, and pre-post test, we've got indirect and direct. And the little thing about self-regulated learning activity, well, that is um, sort of like a little extra benefit. But believe me, if you're going to turn your students into self-regulated learners, you've got to do more than that in your course to get students. And by self-regulated learners, these are students who are planning, monitoring, and evaluating their learning. Okay. You know, the students will often like they pick up a book and they're supposed to read a chapter, and so they read it from the first word to the last word. Haven't conversed with the text at all. Have never asked themselves at the end of a section, okay, what do I recall out of that? What did I get? Did I get anything out of that? And they close the chapter. They can't remember the, anything out of it because they're not asking themselves. Um, and that's unregulated, okay? So this is just sort of like an outline, just sort of like an overview of the different measures that we're going to look at. Uh, this is another way of displaying it, in case you like this better. Uh, OK. End of course, only indirect. And here we're talking indirect means perceived student learning. In other words, students are telling you what they believe that they learned. So perceived learning gains. There is an instrument that's been out here, out, out there since, oh, the late 1990s. And it was in, it's called the Student Assessment of Learning Gains in Survey Instrument at that site. You can use these questions all day long, okay, I'll, if you don't even pick and choose or whatever. Um, or you can, you know, you can become a part of the, 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 you know, the study. It's not, it's really pretty much been studied by now. But in any case, you could, you're free to use these. This was put together um, initially by a, uh, Professor, science professor, I think it's chemistry, Dr. Elaine Seymour. And she did this because she was, she was sick and tired of her uh, colleagues telling her that, oh, yeah, I'd like to do some active learning. I'd like to do some learning-centered stuff. But I'm afraid to 
because even if the students learn more, they'll rate me down lower. Okay, my ratings will suffer. And so this was in the late 90s. Well, she went ahead with this anyway. And I'll just tell you about some of the items since they're so easy to find. Um, the I, there are items on, and this could be really, really good information for you anyway. What, what, again, what students perceive to be the most effective elements of the course for their learning. Now, they, I mean, they could be all wet, but this is what they think they're learning uh, the most from. So it's looking at activities and assessments and learning methods, labs, right, in the sciences, and various resources. And you can adjust these questions. You don't have to ask questions on the lab. And then their perceived learning gains. And questions, uh, general learning, understanding the concepts, acquiring um, various skills, developing positive attitudes towards the, towards the material, towards the subject matter, and integrating the information. So those are, I mean, if you're terribly interested in this, I brought a, uh, just a copy of what these questions look at. And again, I have it written on there if you want to look at it. This is just one model. And if you go in there, you'll see there are a lot of models. In other words, this, this uh, survey instrument has been adjusted in various ways. Various people have adjusted them to their own needs. But that's sort of like a very open model. All right. Um, there, it's, it's been around long enough to have gotten some validity, uh, studying some validity figures on this. In the testing, uh, validity testing, there was a found a correlation of 0.41 uh, between students' scores on the survey and their scores on the final exam. That was overall. Things got a little screwy when you started looking at specific topical areas and you started relating the questions in specific topical areas uh, to the scores on those topics in the final. And then things broke down and you were getting a correlation between 0 and a little bit higher than 0.41 but 0.49. So things got a little out of whack there, and they never were able to explain that. Um, but anyway, there is another instrument that they're working on. So if you want to participate in a study, here's your chance. Uh, Transparency in Learning and Teaching Survey Instrument based on the same principle. So there's a form there, and then you can get more information on the study, um, I have I took some key questions off of there on page nine, and you know again they want you to use this. They just want you to use this, and they want your results, <laughs> so they can they can use it. But this is all very much in in process. It's been going on for I don't know a couple of years. And this won the Mengus Award. This won the Mengus Award. That's right. For That's research. right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, you, you can see the first question. All of them are sort of like this one to five sort of thing, not at all to a great deal or something like that. So how well do you understand the content of the course? How accurately does your submitted work reflect your understanding? And then how much has this course helped you on some specific abilities here? Now, there are only like so many abilities here. There are not a lot of skills here. Um, but still, it's, it's something, and it might inspire you to say, well, writing effectively, no, but maybe speaking effectively, right? You might want to adjust it to your own needs. And as a result of taking this course, are you more or less likely to consider opinions of different points of view, better or worse judge of strengths and weaknesses, better or worse judge of how? Very much, though, uh, student self-judgment. Now, there aren't a lot of skills on here, and there aren't a lot of skills on the um, student assessment of learning gains either. So if you would, re oops, if you'd really like to see more skills, um, I put together a list of skills for purposes back when we were, this went, goes all the way back to like 1999, when the provost at the time wanted to give departments choices of questions to use in a departmental question of perceived learning gains. So he got into this. And so this is what he wanted. So anyway, there are more skills listed on page 10. So if you want it, you know, and, and again, if you want to use this sort of thing, you might have other skills. But there are a wider variety of skills here in communication, critical high order thinking, research skills, quantitative reasoning, creativity, whatever. 
So just you know, to inspire you if, if you're interested in this sort of thing. So let's um, move on to, OK, so how do you represent your score numerically? If you wanted to go take this sort of approach, you could, I mean, one way would just look at the average score across the relevant perceived learning items in your course. You know. Now, you know, you might be, uh, I mean, you can game this. Anybody can game this, right? You know, when we look to strengths and weaknesses, anybody can then say, well, gee, uh, I had the students uh, rate their learning gains on 12 skills. I did really well on four, so that's all I'm going to report. OK, right? You know, I mean, there's always that possibility. I mean, you can, you know, whatever. <laughs> and and who's to, who, if, if you've designed your own instrument, who's to know? Right? Um, you've got problems with anything with having to do with perceived learning. Because there is, again, this is recent evidence that students don't perceive their learning accurately. And it was interesting in this um, Bowman study, uh, he, was, he was working with the uh, Wabash study data. And there were students who were showing progress between their freshman and senior year on a, on a number of like, critical thinking dimensions and moral reasoning dimensions, a number of things. And they didn't think they were learning squat. So they underestimated the amount of learning that they were doing. In fact, that article by Porter, Porter's uh, hypothesized and then he found evidence for the hypothesis, that what's, what's really going on here when students are asked, you know, how much should you learn of this stuff, what's really affecting their answer is how many associations are brought up. So it's like, what did you know to begin with? Okay, so all these old learnings, not necessarily all from the course, but old learnings come up. And uh, beliefs about themselves and what they know and all this other stuff comes out. But they're not really doing, the students are not really doing an analysis of what they learned in the course. They're basing, they're basing their answers more on associations. Um, and then students rate their skills and their work higher than we do, on the whole, um, especially in non-science and among intro level students, and especially among the, well, less advanced, but especially among, shall we say, not the best students. OK. So, um, so and most students are not the best students. <laughs> so you've got this issue of students just rating themselves and their skills, and, all, and it's especially true of millennial students, higher than we would, higher than they are by our professional judgment measures. OK, let's look at direct measures, end of course only. Um, and again, these are, these, you, can, you can game these very easily. But an integrative essay or journal entry of this sort, OK, students review the course material, draw their own conclusions about it, draw their own conclusions about their learning and the value of what they're learning. And so they, you, you have them talk about that. Now, you've got to give them direction on this if you want to do it. You've got to give them a rubric. Um, and really, you know, so it, it's not just sort of like a, I don't know, free association or, um, you know, just sort of like a mental dribble. So you've got to give a lot of direction on this. But anyway, it's been done. Here's another example. Okay, answer to a job interview question for the dream job. So the first thing a student does is pick out their dream job. And then they say, uh, the question is, what are the most important things you learned <clears throat> in this course, it's your course, right? And demonstrate your skills in applying this. And so this is what the interviewer is saying. And so it's a, it's a good setup for students. Um, and, but, you know, students don't necessarily have a good sense of reality about what is wanted there in the world. Career Builder. This is a nice website to send your students to because it gives them relatively detailed job descriptions. So they can shop for their, their dream job and find out what they're actually looking for out there. So I put in civil engineer. Because you know civil engineers, they, it's, it, you know, some students go into civil engineer or engineering in general, think it's a pretty mechanical thing, just give me the cookbook. Okay, I won't have to write. 
I won't have to speak, I, you know, I don't have to worry about communication skills, and certainly I don't have to worry about dealing with people, right? So, so this is a little reality check for them. So let's see civil engineering, let's just see if what jobs might pop up here. Okay. Here, let's go to failure analysis. Sounds interesting. That's, that's my dream job. I want to look at broken bridges. Okay, so, oh, it is kind of, there is something sort of sexy about it. So here we go. Let's see. So it talks about what the actual job is, and then it talks about what's, what's needed. Oh, well, technical qualifications, okay, that's what they are expecting that. But professional skills, think independently. Communicate clearly, verbally, and in writing. I'm sorry, they, well, they want an English professor. Um, think and work, cooperate and work well with others. Oh my. Uh, foster strong, lasting relationships. What am I getting married? Uh, uh, embrace and thrive on challenge. No, no, no. I thought it would be no challenge. I'd learn the cookbook and I'd be okay. I'd be able to coast. Um, Show flexibility to adaptation. And so anyway, um, they, they, they might be in for some surprises. So you might direct them to this resource and they can find out what skills are really important. And then, then they can judge uh, what, what your course is going, how their course is going to help them get their dream job. But if you wanted to represent new, learning numerically, right, you've got to one-time thing, and so all you give is the average numerical score or, or grade, but I would give numbers, of the, um, the integrative or targeted essay. You know, right, that's pretty much all you can do. Again, I'm not saying this is great, but I'm saying it's been used. Strengths, weaknesses? Um, this, is, it, this is so easy to stack the results on. Um, and so if you were to be honest about this and use this method, you're going to have to give additional information for your peer reviewers. Like the questions uh, answered the grading rubric, sample essays. You'd really have to give more with it to make this a, a strong enough uh, measure of student learning. And again, you know, there might be better questions to, for you to ask in your particular course, but this is just a couple of things that are there. Pre- and post-test indirect. And here we are getting to knowledge surveys. And what these are, it's a series of questions or tasks covering the materials. It might be reflecting your outcomes. It might be, um, you might take these from a, um, a previous final. You might just sort of make them up from um, exercises or something um, that you plan to give later or you've given in, in a previous version of the course. They should these tasks or questions should be tapping into different levels of thinking, okay, not just all, you know, knowledge remembering. But the answer is not the answer to the question, and it's not the solution to the problem, not even vaguely. It's students' perceived ability to answer the question or perform the task. These are just examples of items and with the, you know, Bloom's label, the type of operation that it is from various courses, they look like outcomes. That's exactly what, what you're, you're asking, or even if they're just mini outcomes, that's exactly what you're asking students to do. Um, by the way, students can take these very, very quickly. So let's say you've got 200 questions. They will rate their confidence level very, very quickly. I mean, you can, they might take like 20 minutes to go through 200 questions. So when you're thinking like, oh my God, this is it. it's like giving them the final, they'll take three hours. No, they won't. No, they won't. They'll, they'll be going ra rather quickly. Um, if you're in earth sciences, there are uh, pages and pages and pages of these here that have been used. This knowledge surveys came out of um, the earth sciences. Okay, these are examples of answers that have been used, and some of them, I'm, well, one of them in particular, I'm going to suggest changing. This one, the first one is I don't have a clue. And there's simply different ways to say I don't have a clue. I don't have a clue because I don't understand what the question is saying, I don't know the terminology. Um, or, yeah, I could probably BS my way through it, but my BS would not get me a passing grade. Okay. Uh, okay. The second one is sort of in the middle. Well, yeah, I understand the question, and 
I think I can answer at least half of it correctly. Um, or I know where I can find the correct answer within 20 minutes. That won't work with today's students. They can find, in 20 minutes, they can, you know, find the answer, everything in the great books, okay? They won't remember anything, but they can find it, right? So I would actually say one minute. That's, yes, they can, they, exactly. They, well, they can, but they can find it, right? You know, they don't even have to know the terminology and they can find the answer, right? Because they know how to work with search engines. So I think 20 minutes is like out of line, okay? Just completely, but that's what was in the literature, so I'm just letting you know. The C, I'm confident uh, that I can answer the question well enough to earn a passing or better grade. I personally would recommend, but it's not in the literature, that you split C into C and D, where C is a passing grade, but no higher, and D is, I could ace it. You know, like I know this so well, okay. Okay, strengths, weaknesses. Students don't always know what they do and don't know. Now you see, this comes out of earth sciences. And there is, there tends to be more accuracy from these things. I mean, these have been used to measure learning and put in people's reviews, okay? There more accuracy in engineering and the sciences because students are more likely to find the terminology strange and incomprehensible, okay? Uh, if you don't know what sedimentary is, that's a really difficult thing to BS your way through. Because you probably don't know enough, you know, Latin to pull, pull apart the word. Um, but if you're in a social science that borrows a lot of common terms, like social integration, well, that's a technical term in sociology, but hey, students are real confident that they know what that is. Right, if they have any idea of what integration is at all, they think, oh, well, that's a society that fits together well. No, no, but it sounds like that, doesn't it? You know. So anyway, the more esoteric your terminology, the more accurate this is likely to be. However, <laughs> and this is a real kicker, students sometimes, not always, but sometimes underestimate underestimate their abilities when they know the most, which is going back to the seniors realizing, gee, I've got a lot to learn, which is a happy thing, but it's not happy if you're measuring learning for yourself because you get a compression effect. And I want to show you just what um, this histogram. Now, this is from a small course in geology, but it is an advanced course. And so I want you to notice the light blue bars are the scores on the knowledge survey given at the beginning of the course, okay? So they're considerably lower than the scores at the end of the course, which are in this deep red. But I want you to notice now these triangles. These were the scores on the final exam. And note that in almost all cases, uh, they did better on the final than they did on the knowledge survey. They were considerably humbled, which is lovely, okay? That's no problem unless you are using these to measure learning for your reviews, okay? If that happens even sometimes, it doesn't happen all the time, it hasn't happened in all classes that, that they study this way, but it happened in enough classes where personally I would be scared of the compression effect. Um, you might want to find out how it, how it works in your class, and that would be fine, because you may or may not get that effect, but I would be, I would be very worried about it. So, um, now, how can you represent this numerically? Well, you can simply look at the average difference between pre and post-test pre and post -test confidence ratings, but there probably is a better way. Calculation of gaining confidence between pre and post-test, there are, I'm gonna, we're going to touch on this later. There are a couple of equations that I'm going to tell you about a little later when we get finished with all the pre and post test stuff. Let's get the pre and post test direct, which we mentioned before, you're scientifically on the strongest, strongest footing here. Okay, there are different ways you can do this. They're all sort of variations on a theme. But one way that it's been done is to have the students in the very first week do an ungraded writing assignment where you ask them to, um, I don't know, 
define, define key concepts and principles, techniques, processes. Uh, in the article, that this, the article that it came out of, I didn't like the initial questions because they were all very much knowledge remembering, maybe, maybe at best comprehension questions. So they were very low level, and I didn't like that. But I'm just letting you know. But the idea, and here's the fun thing, is what happens at the final, where the students get this, uh, their, 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 their first week writing assignment, they get it back. And what they do is this, they play professor and grade it and write a letter to the student, which was their pre-class self. And I thought, this is kind of cool. So it's set up this way, the final written assignment. You've just finished your PhD at That Was Tough University <laughs> and have been hired as a new professor at You Better Get Tenure University. You have expertise in criminology. This was done in criminology course. And decide to teach an undergraduate course in miscarriages of justice, which is exactly the name of the course that they finished, or they are finishing now. And first they say, well, why do you think it's important to offer such a course so it's a justification of the importance of the subject matter? So that's the, the first part of it. Um, but on the uh, first day of class, you ask your students to consider what they already know about wrongful conviction and or miscarriages of justice. To accomplish this, you hand out an in-class writing assignment. One of your students, that's you before, uh, turns in the attached paper. Comment on the in-class assignment section by section in a letter to the student. And then she talks about the length and um, at least five pages. So, um, so clarify where your students made errors, actual or logical. Provide an answer that's more accurate and complete for each section based on your knowledge of the course material. This is a lot of grading, right? But it's, it's, you know, that's not the point. Explain to the student where his or her reasoning is consistent with what scholars know about miscarriages of justice and where it departs. And finish your letter by giving the student a grade, one a, a grade out of 10 points, 10 possible points on his or her class assignment. And you know, would say, this is not related to your grade at all, OK? So anyway, I thought that I, I really liked the way it placed the student in the position of the faculty member where the faculty, you know, as a faculty member, somebody knowledgeable now gets to uh, correct oneself. And so this is, this is one version of a pre-post test means of measuring learning. Now, if you're going to represent this numerically, you could simply, you know, average numerical score, grade of the student's um, corrected corrections final, the student final, or you can wait and find out about these equations. If you're going to do a pre-post test, formal pre-post test, you're going to have to score, not grade, but score that first uh, week writing assignment, right? Because you've you know, got to give points, so you've got to, got to look, at the, look at the change in points. OK, this is close, but it's a little bit different. And this was done by a professor at um, uh, Professor Coggeshell. He's a professor of anthropology at Clemson. And he was somebody who really inspired me to get more and more into this measuring learning stuff. I said, wow, what a cool idea. He got into this because he was, you know, a lot of learning was going on in his class, but the students simply didn't love him. Okay? And now, he's a lovable guy. Don't get me wrong. But he's kind of tough. Okay? I mean, you know, you're not going to talk another half a point out of him. I mean, you, you, know, you know enough not even to try. OK. So he's, he's on to all the student games. There's nothing you can get away with in that class. In fact, he has many essays on every single re set of readings that you do. And you're doing this all semester long, one essay after the next after the next. And he can grade dozens of them in, in not long at all. How many students in the class? He, now, around 80. Yeah, but he can get through 80 of those many, and he's grading from zero to six, okay? He can get through those in 25 minutes. My hat's off, but practice makes perfect. And he kind of knows what to expect. But anyway, here's what he has them do. He gives them, the first week, a take a stand essay questions. He doesn't grade them. 
And, you know, the thing is that students aren't going to have much to say. So this doesn't take very long at all. All right. And these are the sort of take a stand questions that he asks. Evolution by natural selection remains the best scientific explanation for the diversity of life on Earth, both in the past and the present. Here's another one. Hunting and gathering societies today show that um, our early human ancestors, in order to survive, were most likely fiercely aggressive and male-dominated. Uh, plant and animal domestication represented a major improvement in human history. Most human lives uh, drastically improved afterwards. So they had to take a stand based on presumably beliefs, misconceptions, um, you know, not, not knowing very much because this is an introduction to anthropology course. So, and they, again, they don't have much to say. They don't, you know, they're supposed to strongly agree, to strongly disagree, and then they're supposed to explain why. They don't have much of an explanation, right, you know. So, but that's no problem. That's no problem. They're not graded on it. But come around finals time, guess what happens? They see these questions again, and they have to rewrite their essays. They don't have to look at their old essays. I mean, they can look at them if they want to, but that's not the point. They have to rewrite the essays with supporting evidence and a critique of the first essay, even if they didn't change their position. He doesn't do a pre-post test. What he's interested in, and he hands this in with his review, is the students, how well the students achieve his major objective, which is to develop and back an argument with evidence. So he's going through looking for the arguments, not even looking for the position they take, but looking for the arguments. I mean, some of, the, some of these positions are just flat out right, right or wrong, OK? But um, he's reporting to his chair and the dean, you know, up the ladder, the percentage of the class, percentage of the students, that um, develop and back the argument with evidence. And he gives, uh, he's looking, he, he you know, he's, lo he's looking for like so many pieces of evidence. And if you have at least two disparate pieces of evidence, not, not related, but disparate, you get full credit for it. Okay. And so um, that's, that's what he's looking for. Now, you don't have to do it that way. You can do it more like, you can just score the first week essays as well as the final essays and then look at the learning gains. And we'll be getting to these equations in no time. So you can just do it, again, formal pre-post test. So he's not even interested in that, but I just love the way he was measuring learning. And his department, which w was, was completely embracing his method as his own and rating him on that. OK, now here is the ultimate. And, and Victoria, you're going to love it, I think. I don't know, either that or you'll think I'm crazy, OK? You give the students the final exam twice. You want to see the learning going on? The first week, of course, you're not grading it. You might want to score them. Now, you think, but it's a three-hour final. Don't worry about a thing. <laughs> They're not going to take very long. They're going to look at the questions, not understand a bunch of it. Um, they, they just, you know, they, they're, they're not going to have a whole lot to say. Some of the greatest BSers in your class, yeah, they'll, they'll twirl something around. But um, it, it's not going to take them three hours. And do this in class, and don't do it at all if you've got an online course. Just don't do it at all, because you know what? Because well, you're not telling them this is the final. But don't 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 chance it. You tell them this is the final exam later. You might put some lag time there, because you don't want them necessarily to uh, try to immediately recall everything that was on there. But you want them to recall general trends. Because what's the worst that could happen? They'll perk up, right, when you're teaching about something that they recall from the final. That's the worst that'll happen. <laughs> and as long as your final well represents your learning outcomes, as long as you've got a good solid final, this is a great idea. Now, now you've got a pure measure. Some people are a little antsy about this. They're scared to do this, so that, well, maybe I'll use last semester's final. Whatever, whatever makes you, whatever helps you sleep at night. That's the most important thing. Um, so, and then you, you give the final as usual for a grade. 
strengths, weaknesses to any of these pre-post tests? I have, a, I have a question. Yes, yes, um, yes, yes. If it's not for a grade, uh -huh. what's the incentive to actually? It's diagnostic. You want to know where they're at. Yes, but you that's care. It. You love them. Do you connect it to class participation? Do you do something where there's a sense of I have to do this? Okay. Um, yes, you should. If if you're worried about the students not bothering to do anything, say that. Um, give them some some points for, for, for just for doing it exactly. And you want them to spend. Let's say you're going to give them 20 minutes. Um, give them 20 minutes and say. And I want you to be working on that exam every single minute. And I'm going to watch you because I want you to do the best that you can. You know, because some students will say, well, if I act like I know nothing, she'll start with the easy material. And that's what you want to avoid. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I actually experienced a version of this when I was a graduate student. Really? Uh, Lyman Spitzer was the chair of the astrophysics department at Princeton. Uh -huh. And he gave us 20 questions at the beginning of his class. And he said the final will contain four of these, final will be four of these questions. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you know the 20 questions perfectly well, that's what I want you to learn. Now, this guy had a real sense of outcome. But he knew, I mean, those 20 questions were so well formulated. And I suggested this in my department for the qualifiers, because every year we would make a new qualifier. And I said, if we could have 50 questions, that cover everything we want them to know, and that's the tough part. Uh -huh. yeah. Then, and say that you know, each qualifier will have five of these 50 questions. Uh -huh. yeah. And there's calm in the department, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, you don't necessarily have a measure of the, their initial learning, because I mean, they're like, <gasps> you know. But, uh, that's the tough yeah. part is preparing them. Yes, yes. And, and it's really zeroing in on what's important. Yes. Yeah. So, in your example, um, do you give them feedback on on the test, and also do you give it back to them, or you keep it, or what? Give them feedback, like are you talking about the final yeah, the exam? One, yeah. Well, what you're saying here is you give them the final, give them, you know, like typically it's like a two-hour final. We uh -huh. give. So you're going to just give it to them for 20 minutes, and you don't tell them that this is no, no. represent over the final. So oh, now, think, after they turn it in, what uh -huh. do you do with it? Do you give well, them you, feedback on what they well, did? You score them, OK? Score them. And yeah, I think it would be re you really cool. To, to them or no, 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 no. That's why you don't do this in an online course, because then they'll sit around download, and that's all they'll learn. Right. Now, that might be OK with you, but I'm afraid of too much memorization. Um, so yeah, no, I would, I would share the scores, it, the range, the average, okay. just some basic, right. basic things, as you probably would with Let's say it. Because I've heard of doing this. I've never done it myself yeah. yet, but uh, it's interesting. It is interesting. And you get a, a really, as pure a measure as you can get yeah. of pre post test. Now, is, it, is it as interesting as the other two? No. Yeah. But, <laughs> but it's, this is probably better for the sciences uh -huh. or engineering, engineering yeah, you know, know, where there's a lot of like objective yeah. questions. Yeah. Yeah. I have a really hard time imagining a test in which it's not completely obvious that this is what you should know at the end of the course. Right. Right. So if, if I give them to them and I'm like, it's an assessment of what should have, you should have known coming in, uh, I, I teach a lot oh, of Oh, no, it's what, assessment of what you know at this point and, and right. don't. I have a really, I can't imagine a single test in which it's not completely obvious that this is the calculus final. OK. It, that, it, doesn't, it doesn't look like if an they, assessment of what you should know. It looks like an assessment of what you're going to learn in this course. If they can memorize the gobbledygook that they don't know, Hey, they've got uh, a photographic memory. I just mean I couldn't imagine uh, they're taking the test seriously. Right. Because as soon as they start to read the questions, it should be obvious that this is a calculus test, not a pre-calculus test. Mm -hmm. And then they, they it, you should be able to, it doesn't look like, it just won't well, look like a test of like assessing your background. It looks like a test of since it's not, Since it's not actually the final, you can throw in some easy questions. You know, just throw in some questions that they really are, you know, one and one makes two, and whatever. Mm -hmm. Something that of a low level that they can, you know, to make it more believable. Do whatever you need to do to make it more believable. And some of them, even if you did give them the final, oh, yes, they could pass it. yeah, exactly, exactly. It's just that maybe too few, and some of them would say, oh, Lord, and, and would kind of freak out. 
So strengths, weaknesses, yes. I, I see one weakness as being when you can only do this one turn, then you're known as the person who gets the final of their class. And people pull out their cell phones and start taking pictures of your final. And that's that's the, that's the scary part of this is how st is student cheating. Right. Yeah. Uh, although I think that the that there are fifty questions and only five of them will be there. Right. But, but still, this yeah. idea that they'll once you get known for doing that, uh -huh. they'll find ways of, of getting the information. Yeah. Okay. And also, I believe they'll only learn those 50 questions, and they'll only tend to, I mean, once once one batch knows that right. it's going to be 50 questions for this course, they don't even pay attention to the course. They'll only pay attention to knowing the answers to those 50 questions. But the key was, these, were, if these 20 questions went for years. This was, he said, so this was no secret. Yeah. The questions are the key here. Yeah. They cannot be things you can just memorize. These were four long essays, you know, the three hour exam where we had to answer four questions. It wasn't something we could just memorize, like, okay, I can memorize the answer to this question. So I think, I think that's the thing, uh -huh. I, and I understand what you're saying too. Yes. I think it would be really, you know. So I think it might be more course dependent because in some courses, the, the logic, of yeah. logic, a course might not be logic heavy. Yeah, but more on uh, uh, on knowing some facts, and in such cases, if you just provide a fifty question uh, thing or something, they just know that these questions have these facts that I should remember, rather mm -hmm. than applying those facts to answer those questions. Mm -hmm. Because that course does not deal more on the logic, but more mm -hmm. on knowing facts. Yeah. So I, I I feel that might be more a bit on course dependent. Mm -hmm. That's just my opinion. Yeah. But it's rare that any of us gives the, would give the exact same question. So I think if, if, if we were to say these are the types of questions or the types of problems you have to solve, and you say, you know, there, there, there will be questions about, I don't know, differential equations or whatever, not necessarily these exact questions, because part of what we like to test for is transfer of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And we know that at least our beginning students are sometimes very literal and will assume that like it's, but that question wasn't on mm -hmm. that yeah. test you gave us. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you tricked me. <laughs> <laughs> so it would be very important to say you will have questions like this that mm -hmm. cover these types of problems, and the types of problems are blah, blah, and blah. They will not be these exact questions. Or, or don't tell them it's a final at all at the beginning. Although, as they're not Brian really says, you know, students kind of, yeah. they do but, talk to each other. Yeah, but they don't know it's the final. It's very difficult to remember stuff you don't understand. Right. Well, these were questions and, where I could sit down with an open textbook, uh -huh. and if I were to do those 50 questions, it would probably have taken me two weeks. And if that's, and if I had mastered them, that's, he said, that's what I want you to know. Yeah, you would have taught yourself. So, uh, uh -huh. yeah. so that was the thing. Okay. Yeah. For a lower level undergrad course, it's also potentially demotivating though, right? I mean, if the first week you get this test that is what you're gonna learn at the end of the course, and you're not told it's the final. Well, you know, I heard about somebody uh, giving like knowledge surveys at the beginning of the course. And one of the students came to the professor afterwards crying because they didn't, you know, because they were one of these, but I took biology in high school. And I feel I should have known all these things. And that is just uh, overblown ego. And so I, I see, I don't have much sympathy for that. <laughs> because I think, okay, reality is you don't. But, you, but, but then it's okay, because you're going to be able to do this by the end of the course. You're here to learn new things. And they've got to learn that. Um, and where they picked up the idea that there was nothing to learn after 12th grade, I'm just not quite sure. So they're just in college for the piece of paper. Well, you know, some are. But when there's nothing else to learn, I mean, I would, they need a little shock therapy um, on that one. So, you know, give them a piece of Kleenex and tell them to go learn more. I don't know. There is a debate on the best way to calculate any kind of learning gains, and this is the same thing with, you know, perceived learning gains if you wanted to do it the pre and post. So there's this theory, okay. Uh, this the first measure is this, and what this tells is post-test minus pre-test times 100 over the pre-test percentage. Uh, by what percentage did students increase the knowledge of the course subject matter during the course? 
Okay. So how, what, by what percentage did they increase? All right, fine. Okay, and then there's this one. This is called the average normalized gain. And yeah, pretest minus post-test, or pre, uh, post-test minus pretest, over 100% minus the pretest percentage. Okay, so you're looking at actual gain over possible gain. So it's what percentage of all the course with subject matter did the students actually learn during the course? All right, that's a, quite, a, quite a different kettle of fish. And it sure comes out in the wash how different it is when you start running the numbers. So the same numbers, uh, the students scored 20% on the pretest, 75% on the average uh, on the final exam. Uh, and so here, the first one you get a result, students increased their knowledge of the subject matter by 275% during the course. Sounds very so impressive. Much better. <laughs> Sounds so impressive, doesn't it? Same numbers, but with that second equation, the average normalized gain. Students learned 68.75% of the knowledge and skills that they could have learned in the course, and then it doesn't look so sweet. <laughs> so, be sure you specify, if you're doing pre-post, what calculation you're using. Give the equation, educate these people as to what, the, what things mean. You can give them both if you're scared. Um, and I just threw this in because, gee, I thought it would be interesting to calculate the, the gain for students who scored the highest and the lowest on the pretest and the highest and the lowest on the post-test. It was just a thought. It'd be fun, interesting to see, it, see it, the extremes. You know, think about which, which of these measures do you want to use? Which of these measures appeal to you for, again, you're, what you're trying to do, you're trying to counterbalance those student ratings, which are, you know, more affective. This is not affective. This is, you know, measuring learning in one way or another. Um, and it kind of, it, 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 it takes you out of it as much as you can be taken out of it. And really is zeroing in on, on learning. So I'm just going to leave you with that thought because you might want to think about it for a while. Um, there are so many, but the, you know, there are other forms of evidence of what we would consider to be teaching effectiveness. Uh, some of these, not, not, maybe not a lot of them could stand alone. Maybe they need to be either bunched together in some way. But certainly peer evaluations from classroom visits, but I tell you, they can be po pretty politically charged. Um, and if somebody wants to ax you, they can do it on that. And they can just, because faculty lie too, and they can just say things that didn't happen. So if you've got control over the people coming in and you can trust them, fine. If, just, if, if somebody's going to send people into your, uh, your, your uh, classroom, people you don't know, or you, know, you can't trust them, or they're on the other side in faculty uh, de uh, departmental debates, this could, this could be a real killer. Um, improving improvements in student attitudes, which you can measure in a couple of different ways, particularly important, and they can, they can really be very relevant, in the coins, kinds of classes that everybody loves to hate. Um, Pre-calculus and calculus, those are hate courses, right? You know, they hit the fear courses. Um, intro to chemistry is a fear course. Um, organic chemistry is not the most beloved course either. Uh, quality of improvements in assignments, portfolios, but here you're, you're starting to bring in student products and it takes a lot longer. Uh, students' opinion of their successes in achieving learning outcomes, but again, you know what the weaknesses are in that. A teaching philosophy, if you talk about the impact on your students, otherwise a teaching philosophy just means that you thought about it. <laughs> uh, awards, nominations, peer testimonials of your students' learning or students' performances in later courses, if you can get a hold of this sort of data. Uh, you know, how many majors have you, you know, are working with you or going to graduate school? I mean, these are just little pieces of, of data, really. Students, your students winning awards or competitions. Ah, licensing exam, if, if, you, if your field has a licensing exam, this is big in nursing. Very big. And so if you taught them med surge, medical surgery, and uh, they did, you know, these, your students, this cohort of students, 
did really well on the med surge part of the exam, you look really good and you want to point that out to people. Um, the impact of service learning on, on the clients, for instance, um, or the people they worked with. Uh, Follow-up and exit interviews are great if you can find these people. Employers, of, early employers' opinions of your graduates. But again, you've got to do all this, this, uh, uh, this footwork to get, this, to get these data. Um, successful mentees in your field, uh, you know, what they just won one of, with a field award or a genius award or something. And, you know, you want to say, later on you're going to start getting letters if you haven't already from, you know, students that you had 20 years ago who said, I am an X because of you. <laughs> I'm an X now because of you. You know, you can frame them and everything. They probably will not get the attention that they deserve in a faculty review, but they're still nice to put in there. Just don't give them the original copies. Those are yours. So anyway, all of these can be, can go into a teaching portfolio that's perfectly legitimate to be there. They've been put into teaching portfolios before. So, yes. I just wanted to add that, that we do workshops periodically on putting together teaching portfolios. We will also work with you individually, and we have done workshops and will continue to do them, especially if you request them on conducting peer reviews and best practices for yes. peer review. So there's something that I, I think is important to emphasize for the faculty in the room, that you can self-advocate. You know, before you're ready to be reviewed, kind of stack the deck in your favor by going to your department chair with the best practices and saying, so can I expect this, this, and this to happen? And chances are your chair will say, I hadn't even thought about that. I was just going to show up in your class one day. <laughs> so it gives them something to think about and plan for ahead of time, and you can present them with the guidelines for it. So they don't do you in inadvertently or otherwise. Because now, you know, so they know that you know best practices. Hmm, now if those best practices aren't followed, that doesn't look real good. Mm -hmm. Especially if you can show that yeah. Well, anyway, I know we've gone a little bit over, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. And if you Thank you. Fill out the oh, yes.